Well, good morning. <laughs> I'm outside again trying to give you this time together with the devotional and um, we have our first little bit of cloud cover today. Um, everyone has said that since we've arrived it's been <clears throat> unusually clear <laughs> and nice. But now, of course, it's not. <laughs> and there's um, a nice cloud covering and it's chilly out here, can I just say. <laughs> Good morning, Gail. Um, so I've been involved looking at this chapter this morning and I'm realizing that in the Passion Translation there is a huge part left out that other commentators have seen and that for some reason Brian Simmons didn't seem to want to bring out and I decided that um, there's falling acorns here. <laughs> So I don't want to get hit, but um, I, I decided that I wanted to bring it out, and so I was trying to get that all together for you, but I don't feel like I completely got it together, so I'm going to read some of it from a commentary so that I can help us understand, but we're in, if you want to know what I'm even talking about, we're in Ezekiel, in the Passion Translation, and this is... Um, chapter 28 today it says the title of it says the judgment on the king of Tyre and we've been reading about Tyre for the last two times that we've met together on Friday and Saturday and um, today um, I'm going to read through chapter 28 but I want you to keep in mind as we're reading that um, who they're really describing here that most commentators have have felt in their reading and studying is Satan himself behind the king of Tyre uh, in acting through him um, all the things that he was doing so um, we see that um, the enemy is um, depicted in other areas of scripture like in the book of Daniel where he says that I was trying to answer your prayer or come to you but the king of was it the king of Persia he describes him as kept, um, kept me from coming to you and um, that is actually Satan so this is a, another depiction of the enemy actually through this whole first part of this chapter good morning Michelle and um, so I just want to let you know that as we're reading it even though Brian Simmons doesn't or the, the passion translators don't bring that out but we will be okay Yahweh spoke to me and said, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Lord Yahweh says to you, and I'll just say one more thing, you're going to see a lot of correlations to Satan as we read through and you'll understand why other people think this. Because your heart is swollen with pride, you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of a God, enthroned in the heart of the sea. You think you are as wise as a God, but you're nothing but a man, not a God at all. So you really think you are wiser than Daniel, and no mystery baffles you? By your wisdom and vast understanding, you have amassed a great fortune. You have accumulated gold and silver and placed them into your royal treasuries. Through your great wisdom, sorry, yeah, through your great wisdom in trading, your fortune has continued to increase, but it has made your heart grow prouder. Therefore, Lord Yahweh says to you, do you really think your heart is like the heart of God? See for yourself as I bring ruthless enemies against you, the most brutal of the nations. They will unleash their swords against all that your marvelous wisdom has built, and they will strike down your splendor. You will die a violent death in the heart of the sea. They will throw you down into the abyss. Yeah, that's a clue right there. Will you still say in the presence of your killers, don't you know I'm a god? You know, he, Lucifer wanted to be as god. But you will be merely a mortal man and not a god. When you are in the clutches of the ones who strike you down, you will die like an outcast, a shameful death at the hand of foreigners. I, Lord Yahweh, have decreed it. <clears throat> and then it says the king of Tyre is dead. Yahweh spoke to me again, saying, Son of man, mourn for the king of Tyre. Say to him, Lord Yahweh says to you, 
You were once a consummate model of perfection. You were full of great wisdom, and your beauty seemed perfect. You lived in Eden, in the very garden of God. You, every precious jewel formed your mantle. You were dressed in splendor with diamonds, carnelian, topaz, chrysolite, beryl, onyx, sapphire, turquoise, and emeralds, each gem engraved in settings of gold. I, Yahweh, made them for you on the day I created you. I placed you with an anointed guardian cherub. You were on the holy mountain of God, where you walked among the fiery stones. Your ways were blameless before, from the day I created you until wickedness first appeared in you. Your vast wealth filled you with violence and sin. So I have cast you down in disgrace from the mountain of God. I banished you, O Gordian cherub, from among the stones of fire. Your heart became swollen with pride because of your beauty. Your thirst for glory corrupted your wisdom. So I hurled you down to the earth. That's another reference to Satan and displayed you as a warning to other kings. <clears throat> so great was your sin, the injustice of your buying and selling. You defiled your sanctuaries. So I set a fire inside of you. Let's see, hold on a minute. Let me just take off some of these things that are causing problems here. Okay. Um, I reduced you to ashes on the ground before the eyes of all who saw you. All who once knew you are stunned at your fate, and you've, become, you've come to a terrible, dreadful end and will be no more. All right, um, we're going to stop there. I'm not going to read about the prophecy against Sedan or the, um, the um, promises for Israel being delivered and restored. We'll do that tomorrow because I want to get to this first part here today. Um, it says in the notes on page 131 regarding um, chapter 28. Um, so the prophecy in the following verses details the judgment of the king of Tyre who according to Phoenician annals and the Jewish <laughs> historian Josephus was Ithabalus too. Ezekiel prophesied his judgment as though it had already happened. Although Ezekiel was giving a prophecy over a literal king, he was dealing with the spiritual principality of Tyre, not simply a man. So I guess Brian Simmons does talk about this. So he is <laughs> speaking about the king of Tyre, the person that lived, but he's also in all of this, including the spiritual, spiritual principality of Tyre, which is not a man, but it is, it is Satan. This chapter can be interpreted figuratively since it does not entirely apply to a human king. This is recognized as a difficult text that inspired diverse interpretations. According to rabbinic tradition, the prophecy speaks of the fall of the first man, Adam, while the church fathers found in the same text a description of the fall of Lucifer. So that's where we get um, this, com this comparison to Lucifer and Satan. Um, the first half of Ezekiel's prophecy seems to refer to a human Adam, while the second half seems to refer to Satan or Lucifer. Verse one, verses 1 through 10 seem to refer are addressed to the Prince of Tyre, while verses 11 through 19 are addressed to the King of Tyre. And um, there's some places that he suggests um, going to, to um, study about this. So, um, let's see if there's anything else. Okay, so now I want to go over to um, the Enduring Word Bible Commentary that I use sometimes and um, read to you a couple of the things, the parallels that he says uh, are in Ezekiel 28 regarding Lucifer or Satan. So I think you caught them as I was pointing them out as we went through them. Um, okay, so I, I see what Brian is saying through verses one through 10. The Prince of Tyre um, talking about uh, this man 
the prince, the actual king that was living there. And then um, he gets over into starting with uh, verse 11 and the, the description of the enemy, how he had every pre pre precious stone as his covering. Um, sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, the emerald. We know that Satan was beautiful to see. He was a musician. He was the highest musician. He was, um, it says here, you were the anointed cherub who covers and I embellished you. That's the other translation here. And um, so he was perfect in the way that he was created and he was he was created by God. Um, and then pride was what um, took Satan off course. And it says in this scripture here that iniquity, iniquity was found in him. And um, so Isaiah 14 is the other cross reference that you can find about the light of the uh, I'm sorry, that will throw light on the fall of Satan, um, where he was a created being who fell through pride. You can read there if you'd like. And um, let's see what else I wanted to bring out here. It says, uh, some of the commentators say that this chapter, Ezekiel 28, if you want to go back and read it later today, because it says that it's the most graphic and illuminating portrayal of Satan to be found in the whole Bible. So his original power, his original greatness, his original wisdom, his original beauty, and exalted position are all seen here in Ezekiel 28, if that's what you're looking for, if you want to see it that way, which a lot of people do uh, feel that that's what he's talking about. And um, it says that you, in this uh, portion, it says that you were in Eden, the garden of God, uh, which draws us back to Genesis 3, where Satan was depicted of, in the form of a serpent in Eden. And <clears throat> the power here, they say, um, the power behind the Prince of Tyre, the spiritual principality, was Satan himself, the great adversary of God and humanity. He himself is the adversary of God and humanity, and he was completely um, behind in power and uh, kind of using the king or the Prince of Tyre t for his work. Um, <clears throat> Satan was a being of perfection. He was a being of wisdom and beauty before he fell. This is so sad to think about what God did and how beautifully he created him and how extraordinary he was before. He was covered with precious stones. Um, he was adorned with glory. He was adorned with splendor. Um, there goes a truck just a minute away. <laughs> I think you can tell I'm sitting outside. Um, the selection, the collection of gemstones that covered the enemy um, not only speaks of his prestige and honor, but it also suggests priesthood um, because many of these stones uh, were, are found in the high priest's breastplate that you can see that in Exodus 28. And uh, in Exodus, yeah, Exodus 28, the breastplate of the priest has almost these same, well, has nine of these, of the 12 stones. <clears throat> so um, I won't go through what the stones mean, um, but um, it does say the work, one of the scriptures says the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you. Um, in the Passion Translation, um, let's see. Let me see. It. Let me find the scripture here. Yeah, I don't see it, <coughs> but. Um, 
We know that Satan had a significant role in the music of heaven. Um, he surrounded God's throne with the music of heaven. Um, he, he, in Isaiah 14, it says that he, um, there were stringed instruments associated with Satan before his fall. Um, some say that Satan was the worship leader in heaven. Um, because of the worship songs that are mentioned in Revelation 5 and 14 and 15. So, um, he was one of the privileged angelic beings surrounding the throne of God. Um, he had a very privileged position. And, um, he could have been, it says, the chief guardian of the throne of God. That's what the commentator with the last name of Wright um, says that, about him. And um, in the scriptures, in the Passion Translation, in verse 15, he says, Your ways were blameless from the day I created you, but the other versions say the day I established you. And um, before his fall, Satan had the greatest privilege of being established by God. Um, he was not grasping. He did not have selfish ambition to gain his powerful position in the throne room of God. God gave him this unique position of great beauty and wisdom and, and adornment, and he gave him his musical skill. Um, and I don't know, we can pause for a moment and think about what in the world happened that all of this glory that he was in was not enough. And he began to choose, and he began to wander into the realm of not enough. Have you ever been into that realm of not enough? Not having enough, not being enough? not um, being satisfied with who God's made you to be. I'm going to just go back to the screen here for a minute. Um, have you ever been in that realm? I have. And choosing, beginning to step over into the I need more, I want more. Not in a, when you want more of God, that's different. But when you need more um, glory, you need more uh, recognition, you need more um, admiration from men, um, when you need to be seen, there's a healthiness of being seen. I don't want anyone to misinterpret what I'm saying. Everyone has the right to be seen, um, especially in their family and in their um, marriages and stuff and heard. That's not what I mean on that level, but I mean just um, it's always so easy to go to the example of Hollywood of people and I was actually in that so that was my season of um, holding on to Jesus but also stepping into a realm that I was uh, not familiar with but soon saw quickly what all the enticements were, <clears throat> what all of the um, uh, needs to fill voids, to fill um, places in people that could lead to a downfall like this. So, and very talented, very, very talented, some very anointed people. Um, so, like I said, I wish I had had more time to think all of this through and prepare all this, but there's just thoughts going through my mind of how um, our talents and what makes us who we are, the gifts that God gives us, the adorning of these jewels, like what the Lord did for Satan, the establishing of the Lord can be enough. That's what I want to say today. So you are enough. How the Lord has made you is enough. It's good to um, it's it's good to develop the gifts that He's given us. It's wonderful. I help people do that all day long in, in my music studio. 
Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but there has to be this place in our hearts that we are enough no matter where we are in our journey and that we don't have to be kings and princes in established in the world like of our own grasping. That's what um, he was saying in the commentation that that Satan wasn't, he was content. There's a contentment is what he was living with at first. But I don't know, somehow that contentment left and I don't even know how that can happen when you're in the throne of God, when you're in the very presence of God. I don't understand all of that. I don't know who does understand any of that. And, but iniquity was found in him. He enjoyed, I'll read this little part here, he enjoyed the place of great status and honor until something happened until, and great iniquity was found in him. So even though we don't really understand how this can happen, this is what happened, and we need to just keep a watchful eye on our own heart. And um, I want to see if there's anything else that um, they, they're talking about how uh, the king traded for his own power in Ezekiel 16, and Satan sold his glory for violent rebellion and was cast out from the mountain of God. Um, and let's see Satan was he desired to exalt himself above his associates and that's um, where we read that he became filled with violence uh, it, when you want to be exalted above your associates it leads to violence I think about gangs right now, I think about violence, and there's something there about people wanting to be exalted above those that they are around. Um, and this is also the first reference to some kind of battle in heaven. Um, That's amazing, isn't it? To think that there was this battle in heaven where he fell. Um, and then there is also the thought of, of violence against humanity made in the image of God. The, this violence against humanity is perhaps explained by the idea that Satan rejected God's plan to create an order of beings made in his image. That was from Genesis 1.26 who would be beneath angels in dignity, yet would be served by angels in the present, and would one day be lifted in honor and status above the angels. That's God's order for us, for humanity. Let me read that again. This is God's order for humanity. Satan rejected God's plan to create an order of beings made in his image, that's you and I, who would be beneath the angels in dignity, yet would be served by angels in the um, present, and then one day would be lifted in honor and status above the angels. And Satan wanted to be the highest among all creatures. He wanted to be equal to God in glory and in honor. And the plan to create man would eventually put men above angels. He was apparently able to persuade one-third of the angelic beings to join him in his rebellion. And my daughter, uh, who often gets incredible insights from the Lord, said to me one day about this third that followed Satan into the earth and, and left their places from the throne of God. Um, that they had, she said, Mama, they were singing songs together and they had to have sung the same song as Satan to leave, the, to leave God's presence. We don't know what that was. It was probably something about being highly exalted, something of pride. She said they had to join in the song. And so I loved what she said, that phrase, they had to join in the singing, Mom. 
and I had never thought about that, that that's how that they uh, were taken out of heaven. And so they joined in that, that unheavenly worship, that unheavenly song. And um, perhaps, you know, I don't know if that's what has developed or created things on the earth that are not directed towards God for His glory in the creative realm. <clears throat> But there are still two-thirds of the angelic hosts that are um, guarding and protecting us and doing the work of the Lord. And that's, that's a good thing. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, it says, Therefore I cast you as a profane thing. And in the Passion Translation, in verse 17, it says, I hurled you down unto the earth. And this speaks of the expulsion of Satan from heaven. Um, there are actually four falls of Satan. And this refers to the second of the four. Um, and then when he says, I destroyed you, they think that that... Um, is the fourth fall of Satan, the final fall. Um, <clears throat> the only fall of Satan that's already happened is the one that's described in Luke 10, 18, where he says, I, Luke, uh, says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Um, but there are other falls to come. Satan will fall from having access to heaven. The, um, and to restriction on the earth and then Satan will fall from his place on the earth to bondage in the bottomless pit for a thousand years that's in Revelation 20 and finally Satan will fall from the bottomless pit to the lake of fire which we know as hell and that's in Revelation 20 where he will never be seen or heard of again um, I just want to just say lastly that the reason um, his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. Um, his, his whole sin was prompted by pride. He was drunk on his own sense of beauty and splendor, and he made himself an opponent of God. <clears throat> and God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. So if we want to walk in humility, when you walk out the door every day, you want to put on a cloak of humility. You want to remind yourself, put your hand on your heart and say, Oh Lord, clothe me in humility. No matter what your giftings, callings, um, whatever you're being used of by God, clothe yourself in humility. And <clears throat> I think that's all that we will go on uh, into today. <clears throat> I hope that's been helpful. I, I think it's really important that we recognize what's happening here in chapter 28 and the description of the king of Tyre is actually the principality of Tyre which is actually Satan himself and <clears throat> and um, just so you can understand a little bit more about this created being of God and what has happened to him and next time we get together tomorrow will be um, the continuation of Ezekiel 28 and that's all folks <clears throat> a happy Monday. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for correcting us in our own lives, Lord, and keeping us off the road of pride. Our greatest desire, Lord, is to walk in humility before you and be used by you effectively in the earth. We love you and we worship you. We enjoy your presence and we're grateful for your um, influence in our life, Lord. We, we just say more of you, Lord, more. <clears throat> more of you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry I'm <clears throat> speaking so low. I hope you can hear me. I hope you have a good day, and I'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Thanks again for coming.